Om Shanti and greetings of peace. So today we're going to be talking about Brahma Baba, who is the founder of the Brahma Kumaris. And when Brahma Baba passed away, he left us with three very powerful words. And these three words were incorporeal, egoless, and viceless. Now you might wonder, well, isn't egoless viceless? And why did Brahma Baba have to mention it separately? So incorporeal, I will explain later. Egoless because even after we have sacrificed or given up all the vices, we can still have the ego of who we are. So for example, a guru or a teacher, a master of any kind, he, even a spiritual master, he can still have the ego that, see, I'm so good. I know so much. I'm enlightened. And so the ego is with us till the last moment. The problem with ego is it's not just ego, but in Hindi we say De Bhan, which is the consciousness, the awareness of the body. And that means everything, everything to do with my persona. So, yes, of course, the clothes that I wear, the car that I drive, the house that I live in, the street that I live in, the people that I mingle with, the handbags I carry, the shoes I wear. All this is body consciousness. And so, when we are not in soul conscious, then we're definitely body conscious. See, becoming viceless is one thing. So I'm giving up my anger, my greed, my ego, my attachment, my jealousy, possessiveness, uh, gluttony, laziness. All these are vices. But the ego, <laughs> the ego stays with us for as long as we have this body because we even have the ego of the body. And ego is such a thing that um, it dictates who I am. Ego likes everything perfect, but itself. So ego will always find fault in others, in the situation. But of course, never be willing to look at the self. Because the ego thinks it's perfect. Ego loves seriousness. Ego is not light-hearted. Ego is not happy-hearted. Ego is not flexible. Ego doesn't like uncertainty. Or ego always likes predictability. Because it doesn't know how to adjust. As soon as something is <laughs> gone array, then it has to adjust and it can't manage. And so, yeah, ego is the ultimate battle. And like I said, in Hindi, it's very beautiful. De Ban, the awareness, the consciousness is something you can't touch. It's not material. It's immaterial. But we carry this huge, you know, ego around with us everywhere we go. So Brahma Baba really killed his ego. This is the beautiful thing. See, when Brahma Baba started the organization, firstly, he was, he was willing to put the money of the trust into, into the hands of a group of young sisters. Now, if he had the ego that it's his money, 
he's the leader, he's older, he's wiser, he knows what he's doing, then he wouldn't have trusted these sisters. So all the money was put in a trust. The sisters were on the board of that trust. And that, you could say, was really one of the first acts of humility. And then, even as the organization continued, every time something spectacular happened, he would always say, oh, the children did it. If some task got accomplished, or if some service was accomplished, or he, he wouldn't say, oh, see, it was my bright idea. No, he would say, it's the children that did it. He'd always put the children in front. And I remember um, Jagdish Bhai, who, who is our senior brother, but who left the body a few years ago. And he came to visit Brahma Baba in Mount Abu in the very early days. And when he arrived, he saw this tall, lanky man with shorts and a t-shirt and this man was lifting heavy rocks and putting them away from you know the road to the side so that children could not be harmed so that cars could pass and when Jagdish Bhai got to know that this is actually Brahma Baba he was amazed he was shocked he said, I had visited so many ashrams and I had met so many gurus. But no, I'd never seen any guru off his seat, off his gaddi. He said, and here was Brahma Baba, literally like a father, working with the children, for the care of the children, for the welfare of the children. And we have heard many stories of this, how... Brahma Baba and all the senior dadis and mama would be all cooking, cleaning, sorting the grain, cutting the vegetables, cleaning the cold, cold room, fixing cars, washing the laundry. We've heard all these stories. Now again, if Brahma Baba thought he is holier than thou, he would not have bothered. So... When we talk of humility, it, it's really <laughs> through our actions. And this is the other thing that we have been taught here. I can't say I am humble. Others have to say, she is humble, he is humble. I can't give myself that certificate. So when we see Brahma Baba, yes, everybody gives Brahma Baba this certificate, that he is so humble. And then there's another story of how people came to harm Brahma Baba. Now, I don't know if they had a gun with them or not, but their intention was definitely to, in some way, destroy Brahma Baba or destroy his image. And when they arrived at the gates of Pandobhavan, then the senior sisters said, Baba, why don't you go inside? You will be safer there. And Brahma Baba said, There is no safety in these walls. There is only safety in virtue. Can you believe it? There is only safety in virtue, which means only my virtues, my good deeds are actually going to help me. These bricks cannot protect me. So if I have done good karma, then my good karma will protect me. And then there's a third story I remember of Brahma Baba, whereby there was a young family that had come to visit Baba and Madhuban. And after a few days, of course, it was time to leave. But this family had a little boy, probably like seven, eight, nine years old. And he fell in love with Baba so much that when it was time to go, he didn't want to leave. And they were looking all over Pandobhavan 
that whole campus to see where he was because it was time to go. And in those days you took the train, so you had to be down to catch the train. I mean, you had to be in time. And where did they find him? He was hiding behind the door of Brahma Baba's room. And he didn't want to leave. So you can see how Brahma Baba really won the hearts of everyone. Whether they were young, whether they were old, rich, poor, didn't matter. And how? By setting an example. By being virtuous. And now I'd like us to come on to this topic, topic of incorporeal. So incorporeal literally means not corporeal. And this is another story of um, quite a few sisters, actually. And when they would be walking sometimes, they would be holding Baba's hand or Mama's hand or the senior sister's hand. And they noticed that whenever they held Brahma Baba's hand, especially in those later years, around the 60s, they felt like his hand was like cotton wool, like it was so soft. So what I understand what Brahma Baba did in his effort is that he really melted away the ego. He really melted away the body consciousness, like melted his bones almost, where his body became a body of light, a very subtle body. And also they commented on the fragrance of his body. He, uh, Brahma Baba never wore any aftershave or anything like that, but there was the fragrance of spirituality, the pure fragrance. No body conscious odor, no impure odor. Pure soul consciousness. And so this is what Brahma Baba was doing every day, is he was waking up at two or three in the morning and sitting and practicing soul consciousness, the incorporeal stage or the bodiless stage. So the more we try to just really take our awareness up and beyond, the more we become detached from this world. And really, the less we want from this world, the more we can connect. And of course, the more we can connect, um, the less we want from the world. Because this, this joy does not compare to the joy that we experience with God in meditation. Nothing can compare to that connection with God. And Brahma Baba understood that. And not only that, but why am I connecting with that Supreme Being? So that I can take power, so that I can kill this body consciousness. This, this body, this matter is physical on the one hand, but as I've already explained, there's a, there's a whole immaterial body consciousness that we have to also um, kill or let's say extinguish. And we do that by taking power because we, we could not do it by taking power this way from other people. But we have to do it by taking power from God, from up above. And so what Brahma Baba did is that he created a stage, a state of mind. Let me give you an example. So if there's going to be many performances on a stage, there's going to be dances and there's going to be several speakers sitting on the stage and lots of props, then the stage has to be very powerful, right? The, the stage of the theater, it has to be very powerful, very strong to hold everyone. And so in the same way, when we create a state of mind, a stage of mind, that has to be so strong so that when anything happens, I can perform, I can act, I can dance 
from that stage. So Brahma Baba created such a powerful stage that no matter what happened, what came to him, he was absolutely stable. Can you imagine? Absolutely stable. Unperturbed, undisturbed. There was also a very difficult time they went through where the organization had very little money. And again, Brahma Baba had so much faith. And he said, what did he say? He said, it's his responsibility, not mine. In fact, I'd like to share that story with you, which one of our seniors has shared with us. And the story is that there was uh, a few sisters who were on security duty, again, during Brahma Baba's time, so many, many years ago. At that time, the sisters did security, and not, not the brothers. And uh, so the sister said to the other sister, I'm going to lunch, you cover for me. So she went to the kitchen, and uh, they were all sitting there, Mama, Baba, and the others. And the sister who was serving, she announced to everyone that uh, nobody should take dal twice, right? Nobody should take lentil soup twice because she didn't explain but obviously because there was not enough to go around and so Brahma Baba didn't well he didn't like this idea and uh, he didn't he didn't show anything on his face but he just got up and he went to his room and he went into deep meditation and then Mama followed him and the other senior dadis followed because it was very unusual that everybody sat down to eat and Brahma Baba has gotten up. So, of course, they couldn't eat because he stopped. You know, he hasn't even started. And uh, so he's sitting in his room meditating and the others are just sitting around him. And after some time, Mama said, Baba, the children are waiting. And Baba said, Baba's talking to Baba. So Baba was talking to God in his meditation. Anyway, after a few moments, Baba then got up, they went to the dining room, they finished eating. And then after about an hour, one man comes with his bullock cart. And the sister again on duty at the gate, she's saying, no, there's no way. You know, you have to turn back. There's no road here. You have to, you're, you've come in the wrong place, in the wrong direction. And he said, uh, no, no, I, I'm meant to be here. I'm meant to come here. So she asked him, what's the reason? What's going on? And uh, he said, well, I have some, some stuff in my um, bullet cart and I have to drop it off here. So she said, one minute, let me go and tell Baba. So she went to tell Baba, and Baba asked, what is it, child? And she said, Baba, somebody's come to drop something. So Baba said, okay, feed him first, and then Baba will see him. Because it was lunchtime, and it's just hospitality. So he ate lunch, and then he came to see Baba. And when he came to see Baba, Baba asked him, what's the story? He said, well, I don't know. But I was on my way to the market to sell these things. Uh, but something touched me and told me that I need to bring it here. So Baba asked him, what do you have in, in the back of your cart? And he said, I have dal, I have lentils. And so this was Brahma Baba telling, you know, God that look, my children are your responsibility and you have to take care of them. And so somehow God touched this soul and instead of heading to the market, <laughs> he headed to the campus and he dropped off the lentil and all within a couple of hours. So you can see the kind of faith that Brahma Baba had in God. And he could have only had that faith if he knew that what he was doing was the right thing. If he really trusted 
uh, his deeds. And so when we talk about incorporeal stage, it's really about trust, it's about letting go, it's about uh, being totally connected with the divine, with God. It's totally about being full, full of all virtues, full of all powers. And normally it's a paradox, we say Sindhu and Bindu. So Bindu means a dot, when I'm incorporeal, I'm just a dot. But I'm also the Sindhu, which means I'm, I'm also full, as full as the ocean. What a beautiful paradox. And so this is what we need to experience in meditation. A bit like uh, what they have in design these days, less is more. So I, the soul, in my soul conscious state, pure soul conscious state, I can really experience my fullness. And when I feel full, I don't need anything. Like we say, empty vessels make the most sound. So when I'm empty, then <laughs> I'm screaming and I'm shouting and I'm complaining and I'm criticizing because nothing is good enough. But when I'm full from the inside, then I have everything and everything is perfect. The drama is perfect. I don't want it any different. It's perfect. It's beautiful. So this is what we have to do, is create this very powerful stage in our mind. And we do that by meditation. Because as we sit in meditation, meditation becomes this uh, tilling of the soil of the mind. In the quietness, in the silence of this meditation, I'm able to till the soil of the mind and I'm able to plant so very powerful seeds. Powerful seeds of determination, powerful seeds of success. Really believing in the self. Creating that real self-confidence, that self-respect. And then if, imagine if you have planted such seeds, what, what, what is your, what is your mind going to look like? It's going to look like a beautiful, uh, manicured garden. But if I'm just reacting to this and that and, um, haphazardly, then I'm creating a jungle, a jungle of confusion. And in the jungle there is darkness. In jungle there is thorns. So really, it's in our hands, as Brahma Baba chose, chose this path. He's teaching us to also choose. It's up to us to choose now. The choice is in everybody's hands. That as you sow, so shall you reap. And so let us, you know, learn from that. And I was also asked to share my personal experience. And what I'd like to add here to end with is, um, I saw the picture of Brahma Baba when I was very, very young, like not even 10. <laughs> um, but I remember that every time I would sit in front of this picture, I would just have tears, but it, it wasn't a heavy, uh, heavy kind of crying. It was just, I would sit, I would look, because I was told that's what you do. I didn't quite know what was meditation. I, I was focusing. I was trying to meditate. But I remember that every time I used to see Brahma Baba and his picture, I would just have tears. Just naturally, the tears would roll down. I had no idea, and I was so young. And who, you know, who can explain this phenomenon? But uh, yeah, as I grew up, and um, as I began to understand what a special soul he was, and I understood that perhaps I must have had um, a special connection with uh, Brahma Baba. 
So yes, uh, Brahma Baba has a, a special role in my life. Um, I really admire the way that um, he ran the institution. I adore him for his qualities, his charisma, his dynamism. Um, and I think, yeah, if all of us can just learn by that example, then we can experience the same stage, same success. So, Om Shanti, I wish you all the best. Enjoy these precious days of January. For us uh, students of Brahma Kumaris, they're very special days. We often spend them in silence, in contemplation, having extra meditation, connecting with Brahma Baba, connecting with God. And really, I truly believe that uh, whatever seeds you sow, uh, you will bear fruit, good fruit. Om Shanti.